Never miss an episode of the LGS Podcast. Subscribe on iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Welcome to the LJS Podcast, where you get weekly jazz tips, interviews, stories, and advice for becoming a better jazz musician. And now your host, he's a jazz musician, author, and entrepreneur, Brent Bartstra. All right. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Brent. Welcome to another episode of the Learn Jazz Standards podcast. I'm so excited that you're here no matter where you're listening from in the world right now or whether you're listening from iTunes or YouTube or from our home base at LearnJazzStandards.com. I'm so excited you're here and I really appreciate you taking the time to listen. And in return, I'm going to seek to just give you as much value today as possible. And on today's episode 61, I've got a really value-packed episode for you. And the topic today is how to use scales in your jazz solos the right way. Now, I always get the question from people, what scale do I play over this chord? What scale do I play over this chord progression? Uh, It's a very popular question that gets asked by lots of musicians when it comes to playing jazz. So I'm here to answer that, but also debunk some myths about scales and how they should be used in musical contexts. So there's really three things I'm going to be talking about in today's episode. Uh, The first one is what scales are good for and what scales are bad for. That's one. And two, how to actually think about scales the right way, because there's indeed a right and a wrong way. And third, I'm going to be giving out some lick examples uh, for how to actually turn scales into musical pieces of information, converting them into actual music. So there's going to be lick examples at the end. And by the way, if you want to check out the show notes today, there's going to be musical examples there. If you're not on the website right now, you can go to learnjazzstandards.com slash episode 61, episode 61 to find the show notes today. Now, before we get started, though, as always, I just want to invite you, if you've been listening to the show for a while, go to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. That just helps other people find this podcast and spread the love of free jazz education to everybody. And also, if you haven't become part of our jazz community, you can do so for free by going to learnjazzstandards.com slash newsletter. And as I always say, you get a free ebook the Ultimate Jazz Guide to Practicing. Something like 25,000 people have that book now. So join ranks. Now, one last call to action for you. If you have a jazz question, you can get it answered on this show by calling our podcast questions hotline. That's 910-LJS-CAST or 910-557-2278. Leave us a voicemail and it could be answered on a future LGS podcast episode would love to hear your questions okay without further ado let's jump into today's show now today's lesson comes straight out of our new ebook zero to improv which is an ebook that helps you become a great jazz improviser from the ground up we've had hundreds of people buy this book since we launched it last month and we're just getting rave reviews back people are loving this book and we're really appreciative to everyone who's gone out and gotten a copy if you'd like to get your copy too you can go to zero to improv.com and pick that up for yourself but today's lesson comes largely from that book and we're talking all about how to use scales in your jazz solos the right way what scales are good for what they're bad for how to think about using scales and some examples of how to convert them into actual music. So the first place I want to start is by sort of going over a list of pros and cons of using scales, but more appropriately, the right way to use them and and, and how you can actually use scales to become a better jazz musician and then how you can actually use them to improvise. Now, I I get... (laughs) One of the questions that always makes me cringe a little bit when I get this question, the question, what scales can I play over fill in the blank with your chord, dominant seventh chord, a minor seventh chord, a half diminished chord. I get that question and I kind of cringe a little bit. It's not that scales are bad. Uh, It's not that that's a dumb question. It's just that thinking about scales as a means to improvise uh, is usually not the best way to go. Uh, Scales are very calculated things. And when it comes to 
jazz improvisation. It's all about using your ear and it's all about playing language. So scales can can really be be risky to use because they can they can risk creating non-musical content in your solos in in, in your in your musical expressions. This is why I think this is such an important topic to to talk about today because I don't want those who are asking this question to to be trying to use scales as some kind of uh, shortcut or cheat sheet of how to play the quote unquote right notes. We want to play music, so let's learn how to use scales the right way. So I want to start by just going over the good side about using what what scales are good for and and what scales are bad for. So let me start with the bad. Let's get the negative out of the way. The first thing that scales are bad for is learning jazz language. To learn jazz language, you need to be listening to jazz music, and you need to be learning solos and smaller musical phrases and licks and such by the jazz greats or jazz musicians you admire. And when we think about scales, they're they're really not music. Scales by themselves are not music. They will not help you learn the way jazz musicians speak and communicate with each other. Okay, so scales are bad for learning jazz language. Now, number two... Scales are bad for learning how to play melodically. A scale is not a melody. A scale is a set of musical notes ordered by fundamental frequency or pitch. That's just a little bland textbook definition for you. So to play melodically, you obviously need to be learning how to play melodies. And you need to be creating melodies. And scales can show you, again, like I said before, the quote-unquote right notes to play are. But they don't teach you how to create actual music. All right, now the third thing that scales are bad for is improving your ear. And like I mentioned, your ear is one of the most important assets that you have as a musician, especially in jazz. Because when it comes to improvising, you're trying to play the things that you're hearing in your head. So scales aren't really equipping you to do that. Scales are very calculated things. So they're not helping you get a better ear. So that's what scales are are in general not good for. So so far, pretty bad, uh, pretty bad little look here for the scales. They're not good for learning jazz language. They're not good for learning how to play melodically, and they're not good for improving your ear, which are all very important things for playing jazz. Okay, but let's shift to the positive side. What scales are actually useful for? Because uh, they are useful and they are important, and I don't want anything I just said to make you think otherwise. So number one. Scales are useful for learning your instrument, okay? Scales are essential for learning how to navigate your instrument, understanding chord qualities, how to read music, uh, and other key elements of playing music. So if you want to be a good jazz improviser, you really need to know your instrument, right? That I mean, it's really important because jazz requires a certain level of virtuosity of just mastery and understanding your instrument. And so scales are one of those essential things that, that you know, not only traditionally have been important, they still are important today and they still help you learn your instrument and map out your instrument. Okay, number two, what scales are useful for? Scales are useful for technique. They can help you train you to move freely around your instrument without restriction so that you can execute any musical situation you come across. And we want that, right? We don't want to be restrained by uh, our, our abilities. We want to break through that. We want to constantly be able to navigate our instruments uh, flawlessly. Number three, what scales are useful for, and this is really going to be the springboard for the rest of our conversation today, and that is scales are useful for conceptualizing musical ideas. Scales can help you identify pitch collections, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, that conceptualize a harmonic or melodic concept. So it, it can be really helpful to understand different aspects of music theory to help you conceptualize jazz improvisation. So as much as learning jazz language by ear and playing by ear and listening to jazz is important, it's also incredibly important to add into your musical diet a little bit of jazz theory, a little bit of conceptualization to help you understand the full scope of things that are going on in jazz music and in music in general. Okay, so that let's review that really quick. They're useful for learning your instrument. They're useful for technique. And lastly, conceptualizing musical ideas, which is what I want to talk about next. The way we think about using scales is incredibly important. I really believe that the way you uh, think about things, the way you perceive them, can really change the trajectory of how you approach these sort of things. And so as far as thinking about scales 
There's uh, two words that I like to think about scales with, and that is pitch collections. Pitch collections. Now, what, what does that mean to have a pitch collection? It's essentially, the way I like to think about it is it's a map. It's a map of a chord. So imagine you're looking at a, a map, like just say like a, a regular road map or, or a map of, of a neighborhood, but that's a chord, okay? This is a map of a chord, and all around you have different... Uh, you know, little markers of locations. Uh, I would say the major cities, they're in red, right? The major cities would be the root, uh, the the third, the fifth, and the seventh. Those are kind of the, the main structures of, of a seventh chord uh, or any chord really. And then in between all that, you've got the in-between notes. You've got uh, the second, you've got the fourth, you've got the sixth, or you can also label them as extensions, ninth, the eleventh, the 13th and they're they're mapped out everywhere and they're kind of just showing you where everything is now they're not necessarily showing you how to connect the dots they're just showing you where everything is so that's a, p- a pitch collection it's like a map of a chord instead of a map of a town or a city it's a chord so when we think about scales like pitch collections we're no longer thinking them as a means to create melodies because as we already discussed they're not good for doing that they're not good for playing jazz language they're kind of just good for showing you where things are and you know i get this question in emails um and i've also had uh, members of our course 30 days to better jazz playing ask me this question and they'll say, I don't, how do I get my, like, uh, you know, the scales to play over this chord? How do I get them to sound quote unquote jazzy? And <laughs> what they're really asking me is how do I actually make these scales sound like music? Um, and the answer is not through playing scales in and of themselves. So we have to shift our thinking, our perspective about scales and to thinking about scales as pitch collection collections. These are the options we have. These are the map of, of different places we can go. The question is, how do we connect the dots? So we need to think about scales as pitch collections. Hey everybody, just taking a quick break from today's show to talk to you about our e-course, 30 Days to Better Jazz Playing. You know, I get emails almost every day from jazz musicians asking the questions, what do I practice and how do I practice? They know where they want to be in their jazz playing. They know how they want to sound. They're just not exactly sure how to get there. And that's why me and the LGS team have created our new e-course, 30 Days to Better Jazz Playing. 30 Days to Better Jazz Playing is an audio e-course that brings you through 30 days of focused, goal-oriented practicing where you're going to be working on things that will actually improve your jazz playing. This course is designed for all instruments and for all skill levels and is really great for anybody looking to practice with purpose and to make real improvement in their jazz playing. If you want to learn more about this e-course, go to learnjazzstandards.com slash 30 days. That's learnjazzstandards.com slash 30 days. I hope to see you in the course. So let's go ahead and look a little further into this. What do I mean by pitch collections? How does this actually look when it actually plays out, when we're actually thinking about scales as pitch collections and creating melodies, using them and thinking about them that way? So let's let's start with the basics here. Let's start with a major scale. This is a scale that probably you're already familiar with. Sounds like this. So boring old major scale. Now, what chords could we use this scale over thinking about it as a pitch collection? Well, we could use it over a major seven chord, a major nine chord, a major 11 chord, a major 13th chord. Those are some options here. So let's just take a a, a C major seventh chord, concert C major seven, and we're just going to create a little melody over top of it. So here's like a little major lick using only the notes from the major scale. All right, let me play one more time. Remember, you can find uh, the notation for this lick at the show notes. That's learnjazzstandards.com slash 
episode 61. Here it is again. Okay, so no chromaticism in there. That's only notes from the C major scale. That's all it really is. And that's just one example of a melody. But you have to admit, that didn't sound like a scale, did it? No, it sounded like a melody. And you could create many different variations of that. You could create your own melodies using those notes, using that map of that chord, C major 7. Now, I want to take this pitch collections thing a little bit further and and we're going to move on to another key chord that you're always going to find in any kind of music especially jazz and that's a minor 7 chord. So, we're going to we're going to really hit this home by taking a Dorian mode, okay? The Dorian mode is a sec- essentially if you're not if you don't really understand what modes are, uh, for every single scale tone in a major scale, you can start the scale starting on a different s- scale tone. So, for example, Dorian starts on the second tone of the C major scale. What's the second tone? That's D. So you're basically starting the C major scale on D and ending on D. And so what you have there is a Dorian mode. So this next example, well, let's just play the Dorian mode for a second. So that's D Dorian starting the C major scale on the D and ending on the D. So it's a minor sound. Now, what chords can you use the Dorian mode over? Well, you could use it over a minor seventh, uh, a minor sixth, a minor ninth, a minor eleventh, a minor thirteenth. Those are some options for you there. Um, So let's just create a little melody using that Dorian mode. So here's another little lick, and this is just going to be over a regular D minor seventh chord. Let's listen to this one more time. Again, no chromaticism there. That's just using the Dorian mode to create that melody. Doesn't sound like a scale. It's a melody. And that's just one idea that I came up with. You come up with many other ideas of your own. So let's move on to another key chord. And that is a dominant seventh chord. Super important chord, especially in jazz. Uh, It has multiple different functions, but when it comes to the dominant seventh chord, the most associated scale or mode we could use is the mixolydian mode. Okay, mixolydian, that would be the fifth mode of the major scale. So essentially, like the Dorian started on the second scale tone of the major scale, the mixolydian starts on the fifth. So in the key of C, if we're just doing a, a, a mixolydian, it would be G because it starts on the fifth tone of the C major scale. So starts on G, ends on G. Here it is, just so you can listen to it. So that's G mixolydian, and you can hear that flat seven in there, which is essentially what makes it a dominant sound. Now, what chords can you use the mixolydian mode or scale over? You can use it over a dominant seventh chord, of course, a dominant ninth or a thirteenth, or even a dominant seven sus chord. Those are some options. So let's just do a a lick, a mixolydian lick using only those scale tones over a C7 chord. Here it is. Now, you maybe heard that I did use one chromatic note in there. So I guess you could say I cheated a little bit. I went da, 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 di to end the phrase there. Uh, But that just shows you how just one simple little chromatic change can really boost that line. But it's only using notes from the Mixolydian scale. So it's very simple. And let's listen to it one more time just so we can hear it. Now let's look at another chord here. This is a half diminished chord or also known as a minor seven flat five chord and it normally functions as a two chord in a minor two five one or or, or a six two five one or something like that. Now a lot of people don't really know what to play over this chord. It's kind of a mystery chord. How do I approach it in my improvisation? Well this is where conceptualizing can really help in your jazz playing using scales to conceptualize. Now there's a couple different options that you can use. But the most simple one that you can use is to think of it as Locrian. 
Now, what is Locrian? It's another mode of the major scale, and it's essentially the seventh mode of the major scale, meaning that it's starting on the seventh tone and ending on the seventh tone. So in the key of C major, that would be B. It's starting on a B and ending on a B. You can almost just think of it as starting a major scale just a half step above it, right? Or below it, rather. Half step below it. B, C would be the half step below. Okay, let's listen to that really quick. A little bit of a mysterious sounding scale, but if you just think of it in the context of its parent major scale, it becomes quite easy. So a B Locrian, you could use that over a B half diminished chord. So let's listen to a little melody that I've created over a B minor seven flat five, and I'm just using the notes from the Locrian mode. One more time here. Now, in case you haven't put two and two together here, this is huge when it comes to thinking about scales for pitch collections, because think about the last four chords that we just worked on just now. They all used the major scale. Okay, we, we may have started them on different tones, we thought of them as Mixolydian or Dorian or Locrian, but ultimately they're just the major scale. We all used the C major scale and that's it. So we conceptualized it differently, but really it was just a map. It was just a pitch collection that we used to make melodies. And none of those little licks sounded like we were playing the scale, but we used them as pitch collections, the different modes and the major scale as a parent. Now, I want to do one final chord for you, talk about one final chord, and this really hits home more on the side of using scales as a means to conceptualize jazz language or to conceptualize chords in general and how to approach them. And so for this example, we're going to use a C major 7 sharp 11, or you could even think of it as a C major 7 flat 5 if you don't want to think about it as an extension. And what we're going to use over top of this chord is a B minor pentatonic scale. Now, a minor pentatonic scale, a lot of you are already familiar with. Uh, It's often used in the blues. So it's just a very familiar scale. Let's listen to it really fast. Just five notes, hence pent, penta, pentatonic. And so now, how are we going to use this over a major seven flat five or a major seven sharp 11? So the way you can conceptualize using this is start the minor pentatonic a half step below the root of the major seven sharp 11. So if we're playing a B flat major seven sharp 11, we'd be playing an A minor pentatonic over top of that. So let's listen to what that sounds like when we play that scale over top of that chord. Now, why did that A minor pentatonic sound so good over the B flat major 7 sharp 11? Well, if you think about it, it's hitting all of the important notes in the chord. First of all, the two most important, which is the third and the seventh, those really define the major aspect of the chord. The first note in the scale is A, which is the seventh. And then in there is the D, which is the third of the chord. Now, on top of that, hits some other extensions, hits the ninth, which is C, And it also hits the 13th, which is G. And then most importantly, it hits the sharp 11, that extension that's defining the color of the chord, which is E. So it works just fine. Listen listen to it one more time. So we can use scales to conceptualize musical ideas, conceptualize how to approach certain chords and certain chord progressions. That's how chords can be really helpful. And then take that, take that scale, for example, as a pitch collection, and then use it to make melodies out of it. That's the big takeaway I want you to get from today, is that we don't want to be thinking about scales as a means to make the music. 
We just want to be using them as a tool to map out the chord, the chord progression, and then can use it to conceptualize ideas. But ultimately, we want to make music, and scales won't get us there. Scales are only an important tool that we need to learn our instrument and help map out the chords and the songs that we're trying to learn. All right, that's all for today's show. I want to thank you so much for listening, especially if you're a regular listener. Thanks for coming back week after week. And remember, you can view the show notes and all the musical examples from today's episode at learnjazzstandards.com forward slash episode 61. And there's a lot more great free jazz education for you on learnjazzstandards.com. Remember that you can go to iTunes and leave us a rating and review, and that would really help us out. It would be a great way to give back to the show. We also hope that you call our podcast questions hotline and ask a question. It's 910-LJS-CAST. And remember to become a part of our jazz community at learnjazzstandards.com forward slash newsletter. Next week, we're going to be coming out with a brand new episode 62. Looking forward to seeing you then. Thanks for listening to the LJS Podcast, brought to you by LearnJazzStandards.com. Subscribe to the series on iTunes, and don't forget to join our jazz community at LearnJazzStandards.com forward slash newsletter.